Hi everybody, it's me, Kenneth, and I'm on the line here with David Kamnitzer. And David is uh, a holistic uh, therapist, shall we say. He is um, going to be finding, to be uh, setting up a very interesting organization uh, based on non-dualism and holistic healing. And I'm here on the line with him to, uh, for him to share his insights. So David, welcome. Thank you, Kenneth. I, uh, do you prefer Ken or Kenneth? Ken is fine. Ken. Thank you, Ken. I, uh, I discovered you a few months ago and I've really enjoyed your energy. And even in the last few months, I've really enjoyed your transparency with your own growth process and your, um, especially your, um, your reevaluation of your relationship with the, uh, with the metaphysics of A Course in Miracles. I really enjoyed the, your maturation process and being so open about it. <laughs> well, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I had to do what I had to do. You know, I mean, at the end of the day, there's only one of me here and I have to do what's best for me, so. <laughs> one of the things that I have noticed is that I think many people limit the value that they get from their relationship with the Course in Miracles because they approach it the same way they approach many things in their life is by looking at whether they believe it or whether they don't believe it instead of looking at it like a possibility and being with it like a possibility and then uh, seeing what you see and noticing what you notice from within that possibility. Mm -hmm. So David, do you want to just start uh, with an introduction of yourself and, and how, um, uh, I guess, how you found the course as well? You know, that's uh, usually a way that we start with uh, these interviews. I found the course when I was 22 years old in the summer of 1978. I was the youngest person of 60 people that was selected to a very uh, cutting-edge um, educational situation where uh, we were immersed for six weeks. We were living together, we were eating together, we were studying together, we were playing together, and it was kind of uh, light workers coming from all over the world who had a vision back in 1978. I don't know if you were even born at that time, no. but uh, this was before personal computers, this was before fax machines, this was before CDs, this was really early. And um, anyway, we were coming together because we had a vision that we could integrate the values of spirituality with the, uh, with the mindset and the technology of uh, high quality entrepreneurial education. Okay. So we, it, was like a, it was like a blending of the best of the potential of business and private enterprise and entrepreneurship with spiritual values. So it was really ahead of its time. And one of the people who was going through that six week immersion experience with me was a woman who is fairly well known. You may have heard of her on your path named Sandra Ray. Mm, sounds familiar. Sandra Ray was a student of Leonard Orr. And they were very influenced by Babaji in the East. And she was very, very influenced by A Course in Miracles. And she developed, she took that awareness combined with things she'd learned from Leonard and from other things. And she developed, I don't know if it's still in existence, but she developed a three-day intensive training called Loving Relationships Training, which was based on A Course in Miracles combined with other things. And then she was very into the course at that time, and she introduced the Course in Miracles to all of us. And so over the next year or so, I began doing the course, and I got about two-thirds of the way through it. And I stopped doing it for a long time because what was happening was, even though I knew that the course was pointing to something very important, it wasn't giving me any tools for dealing with the emotions mm -hmm. that were coming up for me. I didn't have the tools for processing 
and being with my emotions. And so uh, I was having a lot of anger coming up that I didn't know how to deal with and there wasn't anybody there to help me. And so I actually got two thirds of the way through the workbook and put it down. And, um, you know, I had many other spiritual and personal growth paths that I was pursuing. So I didn't miss it that much. I just thought to myself, okay, um, you know, this construct, this metaphysical construct, I, I've taken it for now as far as I can because it was bringing stuff up that I didn't know how to be with in a way that was useful. And so I really didn't focus very much on the course for a long time. And then I reconnected with the course uh, as many people did with the Gary Renard's first book and the disappearance. And it helped me to understand things that back in 1978, 1979, I wasn't able to to grasp at that point in my life and at that point in my journey. And so I decided I would go back, pick up the course from where I left off in the workbook, reread the text, reread the manual for teachers. And, you know, you have to understand that by the time I went back to it, I was in a really different place in my life. Uh, I had done a lot of other things. And I think from being the course in a very conscious way, since then, mm -hmm. I, I've gotten to a point where I'm at peace with the course and I uh, I use it in ways that are valuable for me. I don't completely, the, the, the complete metaphysics of the course doesn't completely resonate with me, but that now is not a problem for me. Mm -hmm. I, I've been able to make peace with the course and uh, acknowledge where I think its strengths are, and also acknowledge where I think its potential weaknesses are. Uh, do you want to expand on that? Because I'm sure a lot of people are like, what? Yeah, if you're interested in that, I, I, I'm, I'm happy to take this conversation wherever you'd like. Well, wh why don't you tell us what you find limiting about ACIM? The limiting thing, I think, in ACIM is, well, number one, was what came up for me back in 1978 and 1979. I think that the course as a viable spiritual path would have been wise to uh, either discuss or recommend the importance of more specifically for people to really get whatever help they need to be able to be with their body and to be able to be with their emotions in a way that allowed the process to continue to unfold so that there was not um, repression, there was not suppression, there was not denial in a way that people got stuck in their emotional bodies and in their physical bodies and in their etheric bodies. So I think the, the uh, and I think that whole limitation of the course is an expression of a larger limitation of the course, which is the metaphysics of the fact that, um, all of this is relegated to magic and the idea that there really is no world. Um, that to me is not a, uh, that isn't a, um, a position that I have found to be very useful for me. I found it much more useful for me. I, I have no experience that I can relate to that there is no world. I have I can relate to um, uh, experiences isn't the right word, but I can relate to awarenesses of non-dualistic non states, but that doesn't mean that there is no world. And so I think that there's some logical leaps in the course that don't hold together for me. For example, I agree that separation is an illusion. I agree that to the extent that we identify with any particular form, we are in a suffering situation. But I don't agree with the course teachers who postulate that that form itself, that the world itself is necessarily illusory or is necessarily correlated with suffering. And I think that is the metaphysical weakness of the course that um, there's nobody I know 
that lives as if there was no world. I mean, everybody I know, when they look at the wall and they see where the door is, they actually walk through the door instead of walking through the wall. So everybody that I know well, David, actually I just wanna... lives as if there is... Yeah, and I understand your point of view. However, I, I must uh, say here that uh, this could be possibly due to your interpretation of the course. And certainly of course it, what... All I can do... All I can do is speak from my highest level of knowingness. So all I'm doing is speaking from my highest level of knowingness. Right, I'm but now not... I'm... I, can, can I just finish that sentence? Oh, so sure. And... Uh, this concept that the world is not, well, that God didn't create the world, I have to say that is also, in my opinion, a Wapnikian interpretation. Now, there are various teachers who say that there are different interpretations of that, so I just want to make that very clear. And also, I like to say that the Course does say, obviously, as well, that you know you do not deny the body, you do things in the body, uh, you know, you do have to go through the body to access the higher levels. But I, I know where you're coming from because um, I too do have sometimes grapple with the uh, somewhat theoretical uh, presentation of the course. It doesn't uh, relate very well to the forms of magic, as you said. Yes, and so for example, uh, the idea that um, the idea that when I'm watching a beautiful sunset or I'm um, the idea that that the idea that somehow the fundamental unity of existence and God and reality that somehow that cannot include a beautiful sunset or the sensations of a wonderful kiss, that somehow there's not a authentic unity there, that there cannot be an authentic personal essence. These are ideas that do not resonate with my experience. Um, my experience is that once you are free of the egoic interpretation of experience, that there is experience that can be had as a personal essence in this world that is completely authentic. And that is where I have a metaphysical difference with the foundations of the Course as I understand it, but more important than the intellectual discussion of the differences of viewpoint, what I'm more concerned about is what I see in people who study the course, many of them, in terms of the what I see is the implication of these ideas and how it shows up in people's lives who are studying the course. Mm -hmm. I see very often uh, an unconsciousness or a relative uh, unimportance put on things like the body or um, or one's emotional authenticity or one's clarity of logical thought or um, the importance of uh, uh, making a living. Uh, many of the things that I see course students deal with um, can be correlated with some of these uh, the way some of these ideas can be interpreted. And so my concern isn't just an, an academic concern. My concern is from observation of human beings who are exposed to the course. And for me, I have found that for me to get the most value out of the course, I've needed to be with it in certain ways and integrate it with other uh, points of view and other skills and abilities that have helped to uh, have it work for me more fully. And so in my own life and in my own teachings, I integrate it with um, 
theories and practices from transformational studies and also from my knowledge, uh, my extensive knowledge of the healing arts of helping to balance body structure, body biochemistry, subtle bodies, uh, emotionally, energetically based emotional clearing work, all of these things I have found very, very helpful in helping people to access the truth that the Course is pointing to, and then also helping people to uh, be able to take that possibility that the Course represents and transform it into authentic personal self-expression. Okay, do you wanna do you wanna talk a little bit about uh, this this uh, work that you do this uh, transformational healing? Did you say? Well, I was saying that my work, as I understand it today, I mean, my understanding of my work is constantly evolving, but the but the clearest way I can express it today is that it is a unique synthesis of the of healing different forms of healing work combined with transformational work in in a context that embraces um, non-dualism in the sense of uh, acknowledging the fundamental oneness of spirit and that and that any um, any absolute assertion of separation is an illusion and so my work is really a synthesis of those things I find that many I find a lot of what is out there now in terms of spiritual teachers or spiritual teachings, I actually find them very boring. And the, what I find boring about it is that so many people, from my perception, are talking about things that they have heard or read. They're not talking about their own yeah. living presence. Now, They're, David, my concern now, yeah. if for some for people looking and watching at this video what you've just said is a whole uh it's very high level theory so i want to get to what it is you actually do like give us an example of what you actually do like a person comes with you in a room has say a problem with uh, her spouse i mean what do you yeah, I, I know it's very hard then but okay. you, do you, you get a sense of what okay. i would like to flesh okay. out in an interview rather than just talking it, about it on the high level theoretical level so you're wanting to know what it might look like and sound like if somebody came to me? Yes. Okay. So if somebody came to me, uh, we, would, we would either be in person or we would usually be on a telephone or in Skype and we would be communicating. And my philosophy is very much influenced by Stephen, the late Stephen Covey. Are you familiar with him? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I and love his one, book. Yeah. yeah, and one of his most powerful ideas is um, skill number five mm -hmm. of the seven, the fifth habit, mm -hmm. which is seek to understand before you seek to be understood. Mm -hmm. And so this is something that is one of the guiding principles of my life. And mm -hmm. so the way that shows up when I'm with people is I usually start out by asking a very open-ended question and see what direction the person takes that question and how they speak and what kind of energy I'm picking up. So I usually start out with a very open-ended question like, what brings you here today? How might I be of some help to you? And then I just listen. I'm listening on many levels. I'm listening to the content. I'm listening to the energy. I'm listening on very deep levels. And based on where they take that question, it begins sort of a journey of communication. And then the questions get a little more specific or they deepen or we go on a tangent, we'll come back. And at some point in the process, it's hard to describe, Ken, unless, unless you or your audience is very energetically sensitive. But at some point in the process, usually about... 10, 15 minutes into that process, something clicks for me and I know things. I know that I know things at that point and I'll have a very strong knowingness about um, not only asking a particular question but also getting very clear guidance about 
uh, a suggested direction to go in or a suggested action to take. And at that point, I will either take that action or make that recommendation mm -hmm. and see how the person responds to that. And then the, the dance continues. But the essence of, the, of it is that I'm listening and I'm inquiring and I'm being very present on many levels, multidimensionally at the same time. And at some point, something clicks for me and I have a knowingness and I have faith in that knowingness. And then I move with that and I get permission to move with that with the client or with the patient. And then things could go in many, many, many different directions or many or, or different combinations of directions. Okay. I, I understand that I, I, you know, it's very intuitive, these kind of things. And I, I, I fully understand the difficulty of uh, expressing what it is that you actually do, because I, I do realize a lot of modalities do not have uh, the language to express themselves yet, as you were saying. The essence of my work is not captured in any formula or recipe or, mod or modality. And I use a lot of modalities with a lot of precision and a lot of respect for the modality. But the essence of my work is the, uh, the possibility of the relationship. What does that mean? Um, for me, um, for me, who I am at the deepest level is not my circumstances, is not my story, is not my history, is not any particular viewpoint, is not any particular experience. But who I am essentially is the love that I am. And the love that I am for me is essentially a space of possibility for a new possibility for human beings. So I'm gonna say that again. So for me, this is real for me. Who I am fundamentally is the love that I am. And that love shows up in my relationships with human beings as being or holding a space of possibility for a new possibility for human beings. And so living as that possibility of a new possibility, that is the essence of my work. And within that essence, the process that gets set in motion with each individual is very unique to that particular moment to that particular relationship, to that particular individual. But my prime directive, if you like Star Trek, my prime directive, my prime commitment mm -hmm. is to being that space of possibility, of a new possibility for that human being. Mm -hmm. And within that space, what needs to arise, arises. And one of two things arises. Either the presence of truth arises or the blockages to the awareness of the presence of truth begins to arise. And either one of those is absolutely perfect because that's exactly what needs to happen. And my knowingness that that is perfect, my non-resistance and non-judgment of that process, combined with the focus that I bring to the interaction, provides a very unique space or a very unique possibility for that human being that they may likely never have been in the presence of that possibility before. So you're opening minds, basically. I would say that 
I'm inviting people to begin to question that which they have heretofore lived as if it were true. Mm -hmm. That may not be true. Because to me, that is the essence of the spiritual path. The essence of the spiritual path is the openness to identify and to accept and to take responsibility for and to forgive and to be grateful for seeing and then eventually to release that which is false or limiting that you have heretofore lived as if it were true. But of course, we all know that the, the spiritual path is a lot more complicated than that. I mean, obviously, it involves sometimes assuming things to be true, working with it as if it were true, and then, you know, getting off that bandwagon, coming back on, you know, it, it obviously... It can, complex, it can right? take that form, but not necessarily. But my assertion would be that no matter what form the spiritual path takes, if you look at the essence of what is occurring beyond the form, I say that you will see, if you look deep enough, that what I'm saying is accurate. That if only the truth is true, then the spiritual path must be the awareness and the release of that which is false that we have been living as true. Yeah, I understand. Because, because if, 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 there was, if we had done all that already, there would be no path. We would just be we would just be truth, knowing that we were truth, and there would be no path. We would just be. So, by definition, to me, it's axiomatic that if we still sense ourselves to have those blockages or have a sense that something is not the fullness, the flow, that in my experience, no matter what form the the spiritual teaching takes. In my experience, if it's a true teaching, and by true teaching I mean a teaching that can take you all the way, that it, its essential nature is that it creates a possibility. It's a space of possibility for one to discover what I call the superstitions that one has been living. And by superstitions I mean something that you have been living as true that is really false this reminds me of the left go method are you familiar with the left co method no but i know that left co was influenced a lot by one of my teachers which is werner Erhardt. and Do you want to tell us a bit about werner Erhardt? sure because werner i consider my two main teachers to be werner Erhardt and yeshua sometimes known as Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so Werner Erhardt, um, without going into his story, which if people are interested in, they can find it in many places. But for me, uh, the essence of Werner's teaching is what I call transformation. And um, transformation is a method of inquiry and a way of being with that with those questions mm -hmm. that naturally unfolds um, a process where that which has been lived as true without being questioned now can be examined. And through that process, if you are committed enough, you will eventually get to the place where non-dual teachings are attempting to point to, which is you will begin to know yourself beyond circumstance, beyond story, beyond explanation, beyond time, beyond space, beyond experience, and you will begin to know yourself as this infinite possibility, as this infinite spaciousness. Mm. And then transformation then asks the question, well, now that you know that you know that, what does that mean for you in this world as a human being? And then transformation invites you to create a space to live into 
by taking a stand rather than living into the egoic structure of thought that most of us live into. Kind of reminds me of Byron Katie's, uh, uh, the work of Byron Katie, you know, is it true? Is it really true? I think the first part of transformation has elements of what you're pointing at with Byron's work. But then there is this second aspect of the work, which Mm -hmm. is once you are, once you have this more spacious quality of beingness, then how do you empower yourself as a human being to focus that potentiality into um, creative and productive activity as a human being in this world? So there's that aspect of transformation as well. And what's interesting is that if you really push transformation really hard, if you really commit to it totally and and really, really live in that possibility for years like I have, you realize that it really does take you to that same place as the non-dual teachings. But many people who would say that they're committed to transformation, who haven't taken it that far, are not able to tap that possibility. Mm -hmm. But if you really take it all the way, it takes you to that same infinite spaciousness. Um, But then what I like about transformation is that it also acknowledges that that infinite spaciousness can be expressed authentically into this world. So what, to put it in your words, what are we transforming into every given moment? Well, I can't answer the question the way you posed it. I don't feel like we're transforming into something. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's not like I am this and now I'm that. Mm -hmm. It's not like that for me. Mm -hmm. For me, transformation is uh, many things. It's a it's a possibility. It's a commitment. It's a process, and it's sort of like how familiar how how familiar are you with either some of the different sects of Buddhism or Sufism? Maybe Buddhism. I, I don't know. Okay. I'm not a big scholar. Okay, so there in 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 Buddhism is a big set there. There's all sorts of different sects in Buddhism that emphasize different aspects of and qualities of the path. Mm -hmm. And there's some sects of Buddhism that emphasize mostly this unwinding process to to get back to that nothingness, Mm -hmm. to get back to that infinite spaciousness beyond identity, beyond beyond persona, Mm -hmm. beyond form. Mm -hmm. And there are some schools that basically um, imply that that is it, that that is the goal of the path. And then there are other schools of Buddhism that go, no, wait a minute. That's really just the complete beginning. There are other schools of Buddhism that go, once you access that infinite spaciousness, that's when the fun can really start. That's when life can, as a human can really begin to become authentic. And there are some schools of Buddhism or in Sufism, it's very popular to talk about that the ultimate goal of the path is to become an authentic human being functioning in time and space, but not of time and space. Mm -hmm. And what I like about transformation is that if you really understand it deeply, it embodies all of that. David, this is an interesting angle. I didn't expect it to go this way, but um, I'm thinking about personal development now, you know, the field of personal development. And and suddenly, I, I loved Stephen Covey. He was a big influence in my life for a long time. Um, how do you see the field of personal development with regards to all that we're saying? Well, for me, most of personal development uh, 
is simply going to lead to more suffering because the um, the the fundamental issue of separation and the, the and the fundamental issue of the ego thought structure is never examined. So for most people, it just ends up being a more sophisticated adaptation and compensation within the ego's thought system. Mm. Now, with that being said, if you recontextualize it, and this is where my work comes in, this is it, Ken. My work creates a space of possibility for people to not be limited by those structural limitations within the personal growth model and then allows people to take advantage of the strategies and techniques within those models without the ontological limitations of those models. Do you, <laughs> did you get frustrated in explaining yourself to other people? <sighs> Well, this is the most challenging part of my life. Yeah, I can, I can, I can tell. Because... The most challenging part of my life is to <laughs> language this possibility. My work, as far as I can tell in this life, is to embody and to language and to anchor this possibility, this synthesis into this world during this time space dimension now david tell us about the institute that you intend to, to set up well i want to be I, I want to set up an institute that addresses what you're pointing at that this is so cutting edge that it needs to be anchored into the world and the word institute, that's what I mean. By establishing an institution, this possibility can get anchored into the world so that it can exist in a way that thoughtful people like yourself who, who sense the possibility of this synthesis can say, hey, David, you know, I, I get it. I, I, I'm, I'm getting this, and I really want to master this. How can I master it? Can't you do that by writing a book or, or setting up a process? Is it not the same? No, I've discovered that a book cannot do this, that there's something about the spoken word mm -hmm. that carries a certain power. Mm -hmm. Like, that's the reason I wanted to have this conversation, because obviously someone like yourself, who is very motivated, very bright, uh, has a lot of background, you can see that even someone like yourself, that this is a stretch, that you have to be really available to this possibility. So you can imagine if for someone like yourself, this is a stretch, you can imagine that for many people, there has to be a lot of preparatory material, a lot of discussions that lay the foundation for this discussion, a lot of practices. Oh, there are things in the healing arts that can help. There are things in transformational studies that can help. There are things in non-dualistic studies that can help. There are many, many things that can help people to be able to be open to even glimpsing this possibility because the average person who is being run by the ego thought system, this possibility is going to be either unfathomable or it's going to be terrifying. And so there needs to be a bridge because if you're going to help someone, you have to build a bridge from the way their world is occurring for them to where you want to guide them. And so the Institute would be designed to reach out and then build that bridge and then to be a pilot project to demonstrate the efficacy of this new possibility. 
Yeah, I like that. I'm very left brain. You see, I want results. And uh, I think the, you know, at the end of the day, it's, does it doesn't work. You know, what does it does? What does it do for the individual? If I give you, you know, well, you 50 see, people. Is, yeah, I was going to say, this is what has inspired me because I have had the privilege of having a living laboratory of being a doctor for the last 25 years of being a healer and a teacher for the last 37 years. I've had this amazing privilege of a living library uh, to be in the presence of applying these ideas and and being in the presence of miracles on a consistent basis. This is why I know that I'm not an egomaniac. This is why I know that I'm speaking from reality, that I'm speaking from having been in the presence of thousands of miracles. David, you're a very unique individual. <laughs> could, could you say more about that? Being a unique individual? Yeah, say more about that. Well, you strike me as extremely right brain person. Right brain? Yeah. Oh, interesting. Uh, I, I have, I'm having a lot of, I had a lot of trouble with your language. And that happens to me with, with very right brain people. Or people who um, <sighs> speak in a language of their own. I can't access. I can't access. And, uh, you know, I'm afraid that that's kind of like, okay, so what are we talking about here? Why, why, why are we wasting our time here? Um, but then I guess you started talking about the, uh, the possibility of more possibilities. And, you know, is this true? And I, I could see, I could see the, uh, the truth in that. I got a uh, intuitive hit there, uh, so I didn't uh, utterly dismiss what you were saying. But my concern is to is to you know help you to communicate to your audience in presenting what it is that you have to say, which is exactly what we're doing here. Now, as for my comment on you being a unique individual, I guess that comes with. Um, uh, because I, I, what you're really trying to blend something which is very much, in my opinion, looks like something that come out from California in the in the in the eighties, in with transformation and transpersonal therapy, with a, a blend of non dualism and uh, the healing arts, and I have not met somebody who's trying to do that, so that's why I said what I said. Okay, so uh, I don't know if other people are going to experience it, but you're. Your video feed was freezing up for a second or two. I don't know if something has to be recalibrated, but it's not happening um, now, but it was happening a few seconds ago. It's okay. I, I think I was fine on my end, so it should be recording fine on my okay. end. Don't worry about it. All right. So, you know, the, the, the thing that is the opportunity is also the challenge. The opportunity is that this is actually something quite unique and something quite new. Mm -hmm. But that's also the challenge because the mind wants to try to understand what I'm offering in relation to what it already knows. And so, you know, that is the conundrum of any spiritual teacher is that the mind that the teacher is speaking to is going to do a lot of comparing and contrasting and instead of just being with it, they're going to be in that part of the mind that's trying to relate it to things they already know. And so that, of course, is the challenge when there is anything really authentically, creatively new. And so, um, you know, what normally happens is that when I have a student, um, if they stay with it, if there's something like, you know, you had that moment. Well, hey, you know, maybe it's not BS. Maybe there is something there that isn't just a bunch of talk. Maybe there is some power here. You know, the people who have that sense and they're willing to stay with it and they're willing to apply themselves in a committed way. I've worked with enough people now that there are some pretty predictable phases that people tend to go through and... Um, what I'm wanting to say is that it, I'm not just blowing smoke. There really is, there really is a power 
in this work. There's a power in this possibility if someone will stay open and stay with it, where the where experientially it comes to life after a while. And the and it shows up as new actions, it shows up as new kinds of results, but in a very non-forceful, spontaneous kind of way. And probably the spiritual teacher that comes closest to me is A.H. Almas. A. H. He, he, he writes under the, the name of A.H. Almas, A-L-M-A-A-S. Mm -hmm. And um, I would say about two thirds of my work is very similar to his work. He has done a brilliant job of integrating the non-dualistic framework with the best that uh, psychology has to offer. And so he's gone a long way of creating a seamless integration between psychology and radical spirituality. In my work, my intent is to blend what Almas is doing with the healing work that I do so that it also includes the physical body, the etheric body more directly than Almas' work does, although Almas does acknowledge the importance of energy work. And so one way, if someone is wanting to get a handle on my work and they want to relate it to something that already exists, a way of thinking about it would be that it's very similar to Almas' work combined with the healing component. Right. Okay, that's very helpful for me. Thank you. Okay. So now I can go and, and look at that, you see. Um, do you want to talk... Do you want to talk a little bit about the healing work? I'm I'm interested in that now. Do you do you um so is that energy healing? Do you look at the chakra system? Do you uh you know have you looked at I mean I, I'm thinking of Barbara Brennan, um hands of light, that kind of thing. What is the, My what healing I work is is has many elements. Some of it has to do with um working on the physical body with chiropractic work and different forms of soft tissue work. Some of it has to do with, as you mentioned, evaluating the chakras and balancing them, evaluating the meridians and balancing them, um, evaluating the energy field as a whole and defragmenting it and making sure the polarity is proper and making sure that the size and the buoyancy of the energy field is supportive for human beings. There, I also do EFT, which you might be familiar with, which is a energetically based form of emotional clearing work. Why does EFT work? Sorry, I'll, just to just to ask you out of thin air. Well, there's lots of theories about why it works. I have my own theories. Mm -hmm. uh, I think what's happening is that it is combining the power of willingness, combined with the power of focus, combining with the power of acceptance, combining with um, empowering the... Uh, the emotional body and the meridian system at the same time. Mm -hmm. So if you're familiar with the setup phrase in EFT? No. Okay, well, so the setup phrase in EFT really embodies the principle of awareness and acceptance. So the setup phrase is in the form of, let's say your issue is that you are a compulsive eater. Mm -hmm. So the setup phrase that you would be doing in EFT while you would be tapping is you would be saying, even though right now I'm eating compulsively, I choose to deeply love and accept myself just as I am. So you can see that that setup phrase embodies awareness. It embodies acceptance. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of power in awareness. There's a lot of power in acceptance. Then while the person is doing the setup phrase, they're tapping this point right here which is the balancing point for the small intestine meridian, mm -hmm. which has to do with assimilation. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's also tapping into the power of the meridians. And then there are other aspects of EFT once you get beyond the setup phrase, where you are uh, putting the eyes in certain positions. Sometimes you're having the person uh, 
speak. Sometimes you're having them sing. And so they're activating different parts of the brain. So mm -hmm. it's very sophisticated. It looks very simple, but there are many, many different components to if someone is willing honestly to shift, why and how EFT can make that much easier. And then I also am involved very much with nutrition, balancing pH, nutritional cleansing, balancing blood sugar, helping people to detoxify, deal with candida, get rid of heavy metals, Im improve their immune system. I work with herbs, homeopathy, flower remedies, essential oils. And so what I'm trying to share with the world, what I'm trying to share with you now, Ken, is that when you combine excellent healing work with excellent psychological and transformational work, mm -hmm. In the context of no radical non-dualism, I see miracles on a regular basis. And that's why you need a you need a physical place, don't you? Well, I think a physical place would be good, but I think also something that will not ultimately not be dependent on David Kamnitzer. You know, I do not want this possibility to become unavailable if I leave the physical plane. I want this possibility to be gifted to humanity. And so if it's going to be responsibly gifted to humanity, it needs to be anchored on the physical plane responsibly. And it needs to be anchored into society uh, socially and financially and legally responsibly. And I also want people like you who are younger than I am physically, who are at a different point in your life, who maybe are looking for your life's work, maybe looking for what is really going to be your sweet spot. I want people like Kenneth Bach to know when he's surveying his options for the work he wants to do and what he wants to do with his life, I want people like Kenneth Bach to know that this is an option, that this is something that actually exists in the world that he can access and he can participate with other human beings and he can further the work and extend it because the implications and the applications of this work are virtually infinite. Yeah, David, I tell you what, I can access uh, what you're saying because I I only very recently got into, say, aromatherapy. Um, and uh, uh, things like massage. Uh, and uh, I feel like, yeah, that that's something that I can access, which um, to me is, is very grounding. It's very... Uh, it's almost like a, a it's self love. It's I mean to me you could look at it from a different level and say these are symbols of self love, to to love oneself. Um, but whatever it is, I I'm I'm benefiting from these uh, therapies. So yes, I can I can see what you're saying. Although although I you know obviously I haven't been through yeah. your process. No, and I'm excited. I'm excited personally. You know, as myself as a person, as David Kamnitzer, I'm very excited that Kenneth Bach is open to this and can begin to relate to it, uh, both because just for you as a new friend that I've made, but also because of your sphere of influence, it's very exciting to know that you are open to this and open to the potential value. You know, very often I see people try to go from a conceptual understanding to a radical knowingness. And it's very difficult to go directly from a conceptual knowing to a radical knowingness. If you have some of these other modalities that can help the mind and the body to become more still and more relaxed and more peaceful, it's much easier to have an experiential sense of these possibilities. And if someone has an experiential sense of these possibilities, and it's not just conceptual, you know, I tell a story with my students. I say, I could talk to you all day about a banana split. Or I could give you a taste of a banana split. Or I could give you a whole banana split. 
And talking about a banana split is qualitatively different from getting a little bit of a taste. Yeah, of course, and, totally different. And getting a little bit of a taste is different than having the whole banana split. And I see people try to go from talking about it to trying to have the whole banana split. And the thing that I like about the healing work and the thing that I like about the process of transformational inquiry is that it takes people where they are, where they experience themselves to be, and it gives them a taste. It gives them a taste of the banana split. And what I found is, is that once people have had a taste of the banana split, they're open in a way to the whole banana split that they're not, if they tried to go directly from thinking about it to the whole thing. And so if, if we're here to extend the love that we are, and we're here to facilitate other people's journeys, this makes a lot of sense. Well, David, I, I, I haven't tasted the banana split yet, but I'm open to the possibility. And, uh, you know, obviously, um, I would like to consider myself an open-minded person, but uh, I feel like uh, I also have a fine sense of skepticism with me. So I guess this is where I'm at, you know, like always straddling this fine line between is this bullshit or maybe is my mind being closed off to certain possibilities? So just just letting you where I stand with this. Thank you. Thank you for letting me know that. It's a, it's a radical spiritual teaching because it it embodies the principle of the Zen, of the famous Zen saying, mm -hmm. before enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. After enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. But nobody chops wood and carries water these days. <laughs> that, that's not the point. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I'm sorry to spoil the moment. <laughs> it's okay. I know it's, uh, it can be difficult to just be open to this possibility. David, do you want to tell us how, how people can get in touch with you and access you? Sure. Uh, you can contact me by email, which is my first name, David, and then a dot like a period, and then my last name, which I'm going to spell, K-A-M as in Mary, N as in Nancy, I, T as in Tom, Z as in Zebra, E-R, at gmail.com, david.kamnitzer at gmail.com. I'm also on Facebook. I'm also on LinkedIn. And if uh, someone really wants to talk to me, they feel a strong sense of that. My telephone number in the United States is 858-204-5555. I would very much like it if Ken could create some kind of a space where people who are moved to respond to this video can respond like on a, on a page on the internet or something so that I can begin to gauge the response to this interview. Yeah, I think that the best place for that is the YouTube description page where you people okay. can leave comments and, you know, you, you can put, uh, these links on and your contact details on as well. How does that sound? Whatever you, whatever you suggest. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm extending this possibility to you and to your tribe. tribe. And it, uh, it may be an idea whose time has come or it may not be. And I'm just open to the possibilities. And I encourage you personally, Ken, to observe your own reactions very carefully and to really be open to really without any believing or not believing to just be with this like a possibility and see what you see and feel what you feel and notice what you notice 
No, David, I, 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 I can feel a lot of sincerity from you. Uh, I, it's just that I can't, I can't, uh, I can't dive into it because I haven't tasted the banana split yet. So that's where I'm at. Thank you so much, Ken, for this uh, authentic conversation and for this opportunity to get to know each other a little bit better and to share me with your tribe. You're very welcome, David. And thank you for sharing and thank you for, for your extension. And I'm sure a lot of people will benefit from, from your work. Thanks, Ken. Okay, so this has been David Kamitzer. Uh, if you do want to contact him, uh, the, the, the de details are going to be on the description page. Also, do leave comments um, just to see what you think. What do you think? So uh, I hope you've got something out of it. Let us know what you think. Bye for now.